This morning, if they'll put that up on the screen, I want you to look at the transformers that are up here. Right here. If you've got any children in your home, you know exactly what that is. In our house, it's transformers or dinosaurs or dolls. Um, when I was thinking about this sermon, I was thinking about the little toys that my kids have. They have the transformers. And the transformers, you know, can be a little car. And when you work with it and bring it out, it can turn into a monster-looking thing. And it's supposed to do good. But they also have them on the bad side. And I was toying with this idea this morning about a conformer or a transformer. And in the book of Romans, the Bible speaks about transformers. Jesus also spoke about conforming to the world. And all of us today in this room, you're either a conformer or you're a transformer. There is no setting still. We're going to be growing in Christ. You know, Jesus said, I would not have you uh, lukewarm. I'd rather you be cold or hot. And he was talking about so much of the world inside of you and coming to church, being a part of the world, but yet saying you're a part of Jesus. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on the cross. He went through a terrible, terrible ordeal. But he didn't hold back, and he did it for each and every one of you. And I want to share with you that you've been bought with a price. And if you have not been bought with a price, then you're not of his. He said, I know my sheep, and my sheep know my voice. We are to be transforming. We are to be doing things for the kingdom of God. That is what the scripture tells us. Now this morning, I'd like to share with you just a little bit of meaning about the word conform. What does it mean out of the Bible error? It means to be similar or identical to it. It means to be in an agreement or harmony with it. Jesus said that you cannot serve God and man in. I used to wonder what he meant by that. But as I've got older and studied it, I realized very quickly that me and you, we're going to follow either the world or God. And you're going to follow God to the point that you're going to be born again. And if you're not, then you're following the world. And the world will conform you. Do you know what conform means? I think of years ago, I remember uh, especially my dad would take us boys to the sail barn, the old Tahlequah sail barn. And they had these old wooden benches and they had these old spit cans everywhere. And then people, all them guys were chewing tobacco. A plug tobacco has to be formed. It has to be put into a press and made in the shape that it's in. That's what the world does for me and for you if we're not in Christ. It forms you to the very values and very structures of the world and the world's value system. And you're not going to understand God. You're not going to understand. The Bible says it's impossible to please God unless we're born again. We have to be changed. So to conform is to be made into the image of the world. Like I said, Jesus said you cannot serve God in man. He said you'll love the one and hate the other. You will pledge your allegiance to one, the world or the Lord, but you can't ride the fence. Billy Graham told the story of one of his kinfolks who didn't fight in the Civil War and he didn't want to. So he borrowed the pants off of the, the South and, the, and he wore a jacket of the North and they shot at him from both sides. You see, he tried to ride the fence. He tried to act good enough. But you can't be good enough to serve the Lord Jesus Christ unless you are willing to be born again. And then you're going to be transformed, changed, 
The Bible shares with us in this that transform is to change the outward form and the appearance as well as change the character and condition. The Lord Jesus Christ works from the inside and the world works from the outside. And he changes you. He transforms you. In this passage, the Greek word transformed in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says it has the meaning of Jesus uh, it has the meaning of us being changed into a, another form. You ever heard the saying in the Bible about the old man is dead? That's what it means. We were conformed to the world, but now we've been changed, and now we pledge our allegiance to Jesus Christ. We serve him and his teachings. We have a total change by the renewings of our mind. If you're one who does not like to read the Bible, then you've got a problem. Because God's word, the Bible says we have to take it in daily. We, that is what's renewing our mind. That is what's bringing us to the allegiance that we stand for. It is a complete change for the better. Do I hear an amen? It is not conforming, but transforming to be changed in a new creation, a new creature. I used to like going out drinking and partying, but when I got saved... I didn't want that no more. I didn't want to go to church, but when I got saved, I wanted to go to church. Apostle Paul came to the point that he was going and he was killing, he was putting people to death who worshiped Jesus Christ, thinking he was serving God. But then on the road to Damascus, the Lord blinded him and the Lord introduced himself and he let Paul know. It was Saul, but then it became Paul. He let him know right quick that he was a changed person, that now he would go in allegiance. He went 190 degree change. That's what I'm talking about, being born again, going to the point where you've been changed on the inside. You ever met people who, who are sitting in the church and when you talk to them, you know right quick, they're with the world allegiance? All of their, everything they believe in is of the world. It's against God. And you know right quick, they are not saved. They might be coming in this house. You know, if I go out and get in a garage, that don't make me a car. And I can go every day. I can sleep in that garage. I'm still not a car. And we can come in this house, and you can look like a Christian, but if you're not born again, you're not a Christian. And you will read your Bible. The word conform and transform both requires a change. Both of us are required to be submissive to that legion that we agree to. Both require someone or something as a standard of measure. I just wanted you to understand that conforming and transforming is two different things. <clears throat> My big idea this morning is this. God is always looking for those who will give him their best. In our society today, that's not a very, not a very good thing in our own words. We like to give ourselves the best. We live in the selfie movement. We like to give ourselves all this different charm. But the Bible shares with us that me and you need to give God our very best. And you know what? <clears throat> when you give God your best, he's going to give you his best. I promise you. The Bible says run your best in the race of faith and win eternal life for yourselves for it was to this life that God called you in 1 Timothy 6 and 12. I've got about <clears throat> three things that I want to talk about in us giving God our very best. The first thing is this, your best involves giving God your total being, your total being. Jesus quoted as one of the greatest commandments is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. You know, the scripture says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So, some of us like to do different things, but we'd rather do it on Sunday. You know, I don't know about you. There's times I don't want to come to church. That's just the flesh. But most of the time I do want to come. I don't want to be out fishing like I used to be. I don't want to be out drinking like he used to be. I want to give God my very best because I found he loves me and he wants to give me his very best. Amen. He said, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, your soul is your full being, and with all of your mind. 
You know, I don't know about you, but lately I've really, as I get older, I've really begun to look at the things I watch and the things that I think. And I've learned that our mind, if we give our mind to God, we're going to get rid of some thoughts because we're not going to think them. We're automatically going to put a block on that. And we're not going to let Satan come in and put a thought in our minds. Because if you love the Lord and you're reading his word and you're applying it to your mind and to your soul and to your heart, you're going to give God your very best. Do I hear an amen? That's in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. To give God only a part of ourselves. <coughs> What's that mean? Well, I'm here. Ain't that good enough? Well, no. You can come to church and sit right there with a grin on your face and never listen to the pastor. Never raise your hand to a song. You can sit right there and look at your Facebook all you want, all during the service. Now, are you giving God your best? You're not giving God nothing. You're just here in the air conditioning. But to only go halfway is wrong too because we come in here to worship the Lord thy God with all of our heart, our mind, and our soul. We bear it and we listen to it and we apply it to our lives. We are not called to fall short of loving God in any other way because he's worthy and he wants all of us. You know, we think about that and we might think God's greedy, but no, he isn't. He loves us so much that he wants to spend time with us. He loves us so much that he wants to bless us. And he shared with us that we need to love him with all of our heart, our mind, and our soul. And the second thing I find is your best involves giving God the first of everything. I find sometimes people get angry when their kids or their grandchildren get into sports. And guess when they've got to play? On Sunday. And the only time you see them is when the games are over. I want to share with you, I'm not against sports in any way, and I'm for fun with the family. But Jesus says he has to come first. And worship is important to a Christian's life. It's not important. It is essential. And I don't care the longer you stay away from church, the more you're going to conform to the world and its teachings. Throughout the Old Testament, we read of the Israelites giving God their first fruits, the best of the flock. When you had to take the lamb before the priests and they would sacrifice it for your sins, it could not have a blemish in any way, shape, or form. And you might say, why the best? Because God gave his very best for me and for you. He gave his only begotten son who knew no sin. We serve the same God today in the year 2023, the same God that Moses and them before him served. And he's still worthy of the first fruits. He's still worthy of our best time and our effort and our resources. To give him leftovers and misdirected time and energy is not giving him your best. <coughs> I say this because it, to me it's a, kind of an illustration, but it really happened. When I pastored a small church every year at Thanksgiving, they'd want to put together a box. And nothing irritated me more than when I looked into that box and I'd find rusty cans of stuff. Now the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I'd look in that box and I'd see, you know what I saw? Cans of stuff that had been in their cabinets for so long and it had rusted and they put it in there. It was good enough for them, but not good enough for you. That's not what that's not giving God your best. Giving God your best is going out and buying something that costs you. It costs you time, it dug into your pocketbook, something that you would like to have. I remember that the story, and I showed it once here, a man called Norman. Norman was a, a mentally challenged person. And he'd live next door to this Christian man. And God had been leading him through how to be a better person. And he, came, he brought this suit over to Norman. And he opened this old raggedy closet door. And he opened it up and he started to put that suit in. Now before he put it in, this is what he thought. It's out of date, but it's still a pretty good suit for Norman. And when he opened it up, he looked in all those old suits that nobody wanted that had been given to Norman all these years. 
And he realized right then and there that he was not doing what the Scripture wanted him to do, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Take the time to do something that costs you. Get involved in people's lives. We find that he went back to a, a regular suit place that made him. He said he took Norman with him. He let Norman pick that suit. And he said it cost him a chunk of money, but he said it was a good suit. That's where Christ calls us to be, to stand above, to be a transformer, to rise up and to do things for the kingdom of God by helping others and being involved in their lives. Amen? We're to give God our best. The third thing is your best involves giving God your superior work. I want to testify because... In 1986, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And from that point on, wherever I worked, I'd made a decision because the Scripture said to work as you're working unto God. How many times did I throw a piece of paper and it missed the trash can and fall down and I'd start to walk off and I could hear my Father in heaven saying, pick that up, put that there. Somebody's got to go back and do that. Or why did you push that shopping cart over there? Put it in the corral where it belongs. And I begin to develop this work tactic. And just this year, someone that I'd worked for about 12 years ago, and I worked for him for 15 years, came to me. And he said, Billy, I've never had nobody since you left that works as hard as you did. And I knew that wasn't me. That was Jesus Christ. The man that just left that I worked for for about almost 12 years, he told me, he said, Bill, I've never had nobody work as hard as you do. He said, I never had to worry. And then the new boss that took, took came to me one day. He said, and I'm, I'm going to a Muskogee store now to work as a manager. And he said, I hate to let's see you go. He said, you're the best worker I ever had. You see, if you put the principles of Jesus Christ in your life, and you work as hard as you can and you don't steal from people. You work and you be honest with them. Maybe they won't notice it. It might go on for a year or two. But sooner or later, the Bible says that when you are drawn low, Jesus will lift you up and he will bless you. Amen? And I'm saying that I have become a transformer instead of compromising and becoming conformed to the world. To give God a half hearted, sloppy effort falls short and we're not going to be blessed for it. God wants the very best and we need to do it for the glory of the Lord. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10 and 3 it says, how can we be a worksman who does not need to be ashamed if we are inaccurately misrepresent him? I don't know about you, but I don't want to mis misrepresent our Lord. I want to be a transformer. I want to stand tall and I want to work for the kingdom of God. What does transforming really mean? It means we came in and we've got saved and God begins to take us and lead us out. One of the things that I found when I told my wife, I said, I think I'd like to start with men's ministry. I feel like that's where God's calling me. She never told me till later, but she said, I thought to myself, no way. He's not friendly enough. He's standoffish. He can't do it. She said, Lord, you're going to have to do a miracle. You're going to change that man. And now wherever I go, I go and I talk to men and it seems like they listen to me. I know that God has put something inside of me and I've been transformed. I have found that all I wanted to do was preach and now the Lord has showed me to go and be a servant is far more gratifying than preaching. God has put his spirit in me and transformed me that I now know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Notice I'm saying Christ can do it. I can't. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds, the scripture says. To not to be conformed to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means reading the word daily. Applying it to your lives. One of the things I found about when I was studying about man church, it says if you do not have scripture in any of it, it's no different than having a card game. When I was reading it, it says it's to bring the men into learning the word of God and let God's holy anointing work in their lives. 
It's not called for you to do it. It's just called for you to volunteer and let Jesus work through you. Amen? Then you'll be able to be tested above what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will of God. You know, there's a scripture that I think is one of my most favorite, and I have found it to be so. He says, for I know my plans that I have for you. Now, you can take that you and put your own personal name in it if you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you can become a child of God because God says, I have in my mind what I want for you to have. He said, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you hope and to give you a future. I don't know about you, but I prayed one day. I said, Lord, help me get to that point that I receive what you have in mind for me. I don't want your second best. I don't want your third best. I want what you actually want to give me, first, number one, off the chart. And I said, help me, because I'm the only one standing in the way of that. I can receive all that God's given to me and got planned for me. Now, this has been ordained before I was ever born. If your life isn't where it needs to be, go to the Lord. Let him transform you. Now, I'm going to share with you, he's going to take you out of your comfort zone. One of the reasons I've never took a manager's job is I didn't want to come out of my comfort zone. I like my hours. I like where I was at. But I realized that I, if I'm going to grow any more and I'm going to take this ministry farther and I'm going to do what the Lord said, I've got to pull the tent stakes up like the Israelites. I've got to move forward. I've got to go and I'm, I can't be worried about what I can't do but believe that God's going to help me do what I can't do. Do I hear an amen? Amen. One of the things that I heard a while ago on our song, Victory in Jesus, it was talking about when we get to heaven, we'll sing the victory song. I don't know about you, but I want to sing it here. While I'm alive, I want to sing the victory song. And by singing it, that means I'm transforming every day of my life. I'm 63 years old. I'm doing things I never thought I'd do. And I don't know how long I'll live, but I want a full life serving God. I don't have to live to be old. I'd like to. But whatever it is, I want to be doing something for the kingdom of God. I heard a preacher say that David was an under rower. David was a transformer. He was a shepherd boy and he transformed in one of the greatest kings Israelites ever had. I mean, God said, there's no one like him. He said, he's a man after my own heart. Now, yes, he did sin and he did do wrong, but so do we. We present our body a living sacrifice, the scripture says, Romans chapter 12. And when I, let me get back on that under rower thing about David. You might not understand what I'm talking about. In the Viking days, they had these big ships and they had all these people chained underneath and they were rowing the ship, making it move. They didn't have a big oven rood that they started up and drove the boat. No, they were slave power underneath. And David, what they were saying was, he was chained himself to the Lord Jesus Christ and he was going to serve the Lord until he died. And that's the way they did. They would row the boat until they died. I don't know about you, that's how I want to be in my life. I want to be a transformer for Jesus Christ. And you might say, I'm too old. Moses was 80 years old when God said to him, come on Moses, let's lead the children of Israel out. He said, I'll go before you. It was Caleb, remember Caleb and Joshua, the, the two men that went into the promised land and came back and said, we can take this country. We can do it. And all the other 10 said, no, we can't. He was 85 years old, Caleb was, 85. And he picked a land that had been promised to him, and it wasn't easy land. It was a hill, a big massive hill, and it had giants living on it. And he was 85 years old and he said, give it to me. <clears throat> he wanted a challenge. Caleb was a transformer, not a conformer. The church of God, and I, when I say church of God, I don't mean the denomination. I mean God's church all over the world needs to raise up and bring out our transformers to stand up against the things that God says is not right. Do I hear an amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 52. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, imperishable, 
and we shall be changed, the transformation of the body you have now. Why did I say that? That sounds like something that don't fit there. But we're talking about dedicating our body unto the Lord. Do you know the Lord that built your body gave you fingerprints like no other? Your DNA is different than anyone in the world. Now your brothers may have one similar, your sisters, your mama, but it's not like yours. You ever wonder why God gave you that? I don't know for sure because it isn't really in the Bible, but I believe it has something to do with the resurrection that our body is going to be changed. This old body that's going to turn to dust is going to be changed and we're going to be changed and become immortal, imperishable, and we will live forever. God has a plan even for your body. And if you refuse it, and if you go to transform it into the world, he has a plan for your body too. You will still be imperishable, but in the hell. The Bible says where the flames never quench and the worms never die. He says we need to give our, our God our will. In Romans chapter 12 verse 2, you will be, he says you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see our will many times is to please ourselves but we need to give our wills to God and match up with his will so we can do the kingdom of God. Even Jesus did this very thing. Why am I saying this? Because your mind and your body and your heart all is part of giving God your all. And even your will, you need to give your will to God. Jesus did. He said, not my will, but my Father's will. Father, he said, whatever you want, I will do. So Jesus lived his whole life because his father sent him and doing what the father said for him to do. It was not a happy time when he went to the trial and was beaten almost to death. It was not a happy time to be laid down and nailed to a cross. And if that didn't terrible enough, he spit on, he was beaten, he's mocked at, there, but he did it because the Father sent him to do it. For God so loved the world. He loved me and you. He did the Father's will, and we're called to do the Father's will, to let your will. When Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, Jesus always said, God's will be done. Now, this is an essential element, kind of like concrete. There's certain things in concrete that makes it concrete. This is essential, your will. Putting words of God in your mind daily is essential. Putting the, the word of God in your heart is essential. Being careful on what you listen to and what you watch on television because it's going into your mind is essential. But also, your will lining up with the will of God is essential. I've seen people who, who their will is to live like the world. Then they say, well, God, whatever God wants to do, God wants you to get saved. That's what he wants you to do. He wants your mind and your heart and your soul because if he has all of that, he is going to be able to lead you. The last thing I want to look at is God gives, we give God our time in prayer. Prayer is, the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. If we're going to be transformers for the kingdom of God, we've got to learn how to pray. Jesus, was, I believe, was a great preacher, but you ever notice none of his disciples said, Jesus, teach us how to preach. No, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. We're going to move mountains by preaching. No, we're going to move mountains by praying. And that's what he's called us. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made unto God. So through our minds, through our hearts, through our soul, through our, our will, and through prayer, he's going to transform us into something that looks like a normal person every day. A few weeks ago, I heard Brother Gary talking about D.L. Moody. He was a giant among his time. Started out as a simple shoe salesman. And a preacher felt like he needed to go witness to him. And the story I read, the preacher went past the door, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he made himself go in, and he was scared. And he went up to D.L. Moody and shared the gospel, which he thought was the terriblest way because he didn't know what to say. But through the Holy Spirit, D.L. Moody got saved. 
D.L. Moody began to preach and he began to turn the continent upside down. He started building hospitals and colleges. A great man of God. You could say he was a transformer for Jesus Christ. Look at uh, the world has lost a great man, Billy Graham. Billy Graham transformed the world by the word of God. He was a transformer. We can go through history uh, of men and women who changed the world and changed the country and all around them because they were transformers willing to let Christ move in their life and do whatever he needed to do. That's what we're called to do. I want to ask you today, would you call yourself a transformer or a conformer? Hey, can you conform to the ways of this world and the values of it? Like do unto others before they do it to you? Jesus says do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Have you learned to forgive? Have you learned to walk with Christ? Well, the Bible shares with me if you haven't, you can. And he's willing today. He's looking for people that will be transformers, not conformers. And when he looked at his disciples, he smiled and he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What he was telling them was, through me, you can overcome the world. Through me inside of you, you will be able to live the standard that I've called you to live. Now, some of you might be in here saying, I've sinned too much. God will never use me. I promise you he will. Whatever you've done, it don't matter. He says, I forgive. He died on that cross for the most. You can write any type of sin you want to. Jesus died on that cross for that sin. And he humbly stands before you today and says, let me take your burden. Let me take your sins. Let me take your simple life and change it. Let me let you be a conformer and you will invest in other people's lives. You know, my wife, when she said, I'll never make somebody leading people in the men's ministry, she was right. But yesterday, when all the people in the store, more than I ever imagined, gathered to say goodbye to me, I never would have thought they'd done that. And that was because of Jesus Christ. I used to think that when I die... I'll, I'll have a few people there just to make sure I did die. But because I'm willing to invest in other people's lives, I'm amazed at how many people come up to me and say thank you or I love you. And I see that's just Jesus Christ. He's took a stone and made something of it. He makes flowers bloom in the desert. He can do anything he wants to do and it don't matter your age. He just needs you to be willing. You might say, Billy, you don't know my life. I don't have to know your life. I've been in the gutter just as much as any of you have. I have. And I still find that, that the man on the cross, the man from Galilee with the nail scar has is still standing there saying, come on, Billy. Come on. Let's go again. Let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, I pray.